Okay, so uh, moving on to our next guest, um, Abby Shapiro. Abby, um, I'll introduce, is a curator. She's a writer and researcher of a particular interest in lesser known histories of post-war and contemporary art made by women in public collections. Recent publications have covered the history of feminist installation art, the life and work of Ree Morton, and post-war British art and domesticity. Abby holds a PhD from McGill University, an MA from the Court, Courtauld Institute of Art, and a BA from Durham University. And Abby is currently in the process of curating a show at the Hepworth on post-war studio pottery, abstraction and the body. And today, Abby's talk is about the ceramic work of Elaine Wilson, who was a much loved and respected colleague here at the art school and who sadly died earlier this year. Abby's talk is entitled Excavating Through Possibilities and Permutations. So welcome, Abby, and I'll hand over to you. Hello, thanks so much, Tom. Um, so yeah, thanks. I just want to um, uh, offer my thanks to Harriet for organising, um, to Tom for chairing um, the session, to City and Guild for putting on this amazing event. It's been just fascinating this morning. Um, and thanks to the speakers for their talks already. It's, um, you've left me, if you like, quite big shoes to fill uh, to round off the day, but or to round off the morning anyway. Um, and thanks to the audience for joining us um, on a Saturday. So I'm going to try and kind of keep this uh, lively if I can uh, before lunch. So just by way um, of a quick preface, um, I've written about Elaine's um, work, um, mostly her recent work um, from 2019, um, and many of the issues um, and ideas relating to women, selfhood and bodies that I want to talk about today have come out of time um, I spent talking to Elaine about her work before her death. Our conversation centred around her practice, but often drifted into personal discussions about our own experiences as women out in the world, um, especially in terms of safety and public space, which feels like such a pertinent topic um, all over again. So in this talk, um, I'm going to try and animate some of those dialogues. I'm going to draw on Elaine's words um, a lot. So I apologise that I'm going to read my, read my talk because I'm quoting Elaine so heavily. Um, I hope you'll forgive me that. In an interview in 2019, Elaine relayed an anecdote about a time she was doing a workshop with a student. When one of her students remarked, Elaine, I just love the way you handle clay, Elaine replied, it's because I have no real respect for it. I think it's just another material in the same way as any material I use. It has its own qualities that you have to adhere to if you want certain outcomes, but there's no real reason why you can't mix it up with lots of other materials and it still be a valid process. Now, having no real respect for clay may sound like a somewhat flippant way to bring a discussion of Lane's work into a symposium about clay. Um, but what I want to suggest is that this comment belies something important about Elaine's work, which is the way that her non-hierarchical use of materials was not only technically expansive, but it was conceptually flexible, and that this complemented her overarching concern with her interest in women and their sense of self. What I want to suggest today is the way in which Elaine's use of clay encourages an understanding of past and present representations of femininity and the constructions of gendered selfhood as a mutable form. And as Elaine reminds us, I think in her work, a woman's understanding of herself is never entirely autonomous. It's a social construction and always under surveillance and some form of control. Elaine came of age as an undergraduate student of sculpture in the late 1970s at the Duncan of Jordanston School of Art in Dundee before completing an MA at the Royal Academy Schools in London in the early 1980s. Although she worked with clay as part of her sculpture course, she said she didn't gravitate to it as a material of choice until the 1990s. And the slide that I'm going to just show you now, um, that I'll return to a few times in this talk, is showing some of her, her kind of earliest work at this, at this, um, from this time. And Elaine particularly kind of recounted how art schools um, at this moment in the 80s and 70s and 80s didn't encourage her use of clay in a sculptural capacity. It was still largely consider considered to be bound to the realm um, of pottery. 
Now, the milieu of artists using clay at this time in London was quite an exciting and innovative one, and no doubt Elaine would have been aware of the legacy of young, critically, uh, critically engaged ceramic artists at the nearby Royal College of Art in the late 1970s and 1980s. So this included Alison Britton, Jacqueline Poncelet, Glenis Barton and Elizabeth Fridge. The group's concern revolved around the interrogation of containment and the function of the vessel, as well as its ornamental role. These artists and several others made provocative challenges to the historical traditions of studio pottery and in turn were integral in the, la in the later part of a post-war trajectory of a sculptural turn in ceramics. While studio pottery and its interests in the vessel were never entirely divorced from an association with the body, let's not forget the kind of corporeal terminology we talk about the lip and the neck of a pot, the more recognizably figurative forms didn't become visible in ceramic work until the late 90, until the until the 80s, into the 90s, and certainly by the 2000s. This is just some examples um, of artists who I think capture this really sort of figurative um, moment from the 80s through the um, 90s into the 2000s. So work by Glenis Barton, Mo Jopp and Claire Cunin. And I think it's interesting that Barton was the first ceramic artist to be represented by a fine art gallery in the late 1970s. We're sort of seeing this crossover in sort of disciplines, terminologies. By the, by the 1980s, there was a more deliberate attempt to move away from the terms pottery and ceramics towards a framework for the use of clay that showed its wider and more interdisciplinary application with ceramic works being regarded as explicitly non-utilitarian. Gillian Lowndes, for example, used experimental mixed media techniques and the purity um, or sort of pure status of only using clay and ceramics began to change. I think it's also fair to reference, if we're thinking about Elaine's work, it's also fair to reference a wider context of fine art here too. And in the 1980s and 1990s, radical artists like Helen Chadwick and Joe Spence deployed feminist, um, unidealized representations of the female body. So really thinking about the body in quite different ways. Ceramics and sculpture became more deeply intertwined in the 1990s as interdis interdisciplinarity flourished across British art. Landmark exhibitions such as The Raw and The Cooked, New Work in Clay in Britain, opened at the Barbican in 1993 and toured for several years across the UK and to Japan. And they integrate, this exhibition integrated the work of sculptors using clay, such as Anthony Gormley, Tony Cragg, Alison Wilding, Anish Kapoor, and, and many other names that you'd recognise, um, as well as potters, um, signalling an acceptance or an, at least an institutional le legitimization of a more expansive version of ceramics and sculpture. Elaine said that she had to teach herself to use clay, as she never had any formal training in it but that this had crucially liberated her from the politics of ceramics and particularly from pottery. She said, and I quote, I used to quite often get called a ceramicist, which I really resented because I didn't regard myself as a ceramicist. It felt so limiting to take a material that had so much to it, so much versatility, a perfect plastic material. And yet it seems to me that the first thing that comes to people's mind as soon as you say ceramic based process. I found that I was quite resentful about that because I didn't like to be pigeonholed. Not that there was anything wrong with being a ceramicist, I just didn't think it represented me well." End quote. Following a series of European fellowships and teaching stints in the late 1980s, Elaine's first substantive body of work appeared in the 1990s. This archival photograph of slides of her slides show her interest in the three-dimensional female form. Here the body is rendered quite abstractly as a kind of mannequin, devoid of personal features with smooth body parts. And the female form is more hinted at through the suggestion of breasts and hips, and in fact, perhaps more overt references to the signifiers of femininity here are used through clothing in the suggestive shape of skirts in the um, slide at the middle at the bottom, um, marked as the Enchantress, which I'll show you again in a second. So we see the sustained use of clay, um, fired clay, and that's a term Elaine's using on her notes, you can see here. We see the sustained use of fired clay in these pieces made from the 1990s, um, kind of cohering at the same time as this kind of interest in the figurative representation of the female body. 
So the motif of the balloon skirted mannequins persisted in Elaine's work and it sort of begins at this point, but we actually see it right up until 2018. So it was very quite consistent. And we can see in this early work from 1992 on the left, Ring of Roses, which shows two clay figures joined by a steel ring. And I'm gonna come back to this work a bit later. The skirted figure reappeared in 1994 in the work on the right, The Enchantress, but this time without the figure inside of it. Instead, it seems to just be the garment. In 1998, we see a similar piece called Sitting Pretty, which is um, the image in the middle, possibly recycling parts of The Enchantress, but with a similar or very similar bustier fashioned from clay with a large steel structure underneath, clearly referencing the historic hoop skirt that women wore for many centuries under their dresses up until the 1860s. The female body here might be absent, yet the heavy materials used to represent the garment seem to be symbolic of the weight, perhaps both physical and psychological, this kind of exaggerated attire that emphasized the so-called womanly hips might have had for its wearer. References to the historic female body continued and jumping ahead a decade in the Fleur de Mal series from, 19, uh, from 2008 to nine, we see one of the earliest uses of the motif of the female figurine that Elaine would come to reuse many times. This first came about when Elaine was a research fellow in ceramic sculpture at Newcastle University. She said she wanted to consider what she called, quote, the context of ceramics. Using figurines, which she described as, quote, ridiculous objects, Elaine said she wanted to use, she wanted to set herself, quote, a challenge of how to make some kind of comment on them, a counter imagery using their prettiness without the work becoming twee. I wanted the work to be recognizably part of the ceramic tradition, but not to be stereotypical representations of women. So I bought a figurine from a secondhand shop and used it as the basis of a mold. Subsequent works such as No Use Crying Over Spilled Milk from 2009 further experimented with figurines. Using gold decal based on historic lace patterns, Elaine adorned the figurines' faces. The placement of a mirror underneath perhaps ironically asks us to think about this faceless figure who has no real reflection or perhaps is wearing a mask. As Elaine said, the figurines were made from porcelain, clay that she had pressed into molds. While the material was still pliable, she distorted the figures, adjusting their limbs into more active forms. What she may have lost in definition in these forms in the process, she seemed to have gained in sculptural abstraction. And I think this is an interesting way of thinking perhaps more expansively about the ability to manipulate the long reach of history in which the objectification of women happened over centuries. And this is something that Elaine sort of been interested in over and over again. And this representation of the figurine kind of captures this idea about how women have been um, represented throughout history in these, in these ways. So I think if we think about history, then like clay as a kind of malleable entity subject to the will of the one who shapes it, we can see alternative prospects for its representation. In his book about porcelain, The White Road, A Journey into Obsession, Edmund Duval says, clay is the present tense and a historical present. And he talks about the way of using, or he talks about when you use porcelain, he says, quote, it feels full of anticipation and possibility. It is a material that records every movement of thinking and every change of thought. Porcelain starts elsewhere and takes you elsewhere, end quote. Elaine similarly described her use of porcelain within a language of temporality, stating, quote, they say that porcelain has a memory, that if you push it in certain directions, it's very hard to come back and do something else with it. As you touch porcelain, I always think you can feel it drying under your fingers, end quote. There's something in the tactility and memory of touch in these descriptions that enacts this sense of durée or embodied time, both inherent in clay as geological matter, and we heard this morning of just how far back that geological matter goes, it was fascinating. So this idea about clay um, and time being inherent in geological matter, as it is with the historical discourse of femininity, by drawing attention to clay as a material that by its, by its nature encapsulates this deep sense of time and a change in its physical properties when fired and fixed 
It might be said that Elaine's work allows us to draw parallels with the history of women's objectification, which also becomes sedimented in the cultural expression of figurines or I think just in art in general. In light of Duval's statement about porcelain feeling full of anticipation and possibility and records every movement of thinking, this seems to chime with Elaine's comment when she said, quote, I always know intuitively what I'm searching for when making work, but the process is often unpredictable and dependent on excavating through possibilities and permutations. The more classic shape of the figurine soon gave way to a permutation of its own in the series um, that was sort of broadly called Gun Women and it, in this um, Elaine's titled it here in this piece, Don't Touch. We see um, a new possibility then, the figurine is now active. Squatting, gun wielding, these femme fatales are no longer fragile objects to be looked at, but have been given the agency not only to return the male gaze, but to confront it with violence. Um, and there were sort of many iterations um, of these figurines being arranged in different ways, one of which you can see here, which was um, an installation uh, titled um, Reload, in which the figurines have been grouped. And here as a collective, I think they're all together uh, quite rowdy and they seem up for a fight. Okay, so Elaine sometimes also liked to exhibit her pieces next to the ceramic objects to which they materially um, and culturally referenced. Um, and this not only animated her work in terms of the historic context of ceramic production um, and decoration, you can sort of really clearly see the relationship um, of that on the um, comparative works on the left. Um, but I think the historic pottery also takes on a more active and potent political overtone in reference to the female body and domesticity. Elaine made several interventions in historic collections such as Abbott Hall in Kendall and um, in the image you can see here, which is at Dorwich House in London. And she enjoyed the dialogue um, that came from interrogating the history of ceramics in relation to these domestic contexts and particularly with these um, sort of explorations of, of gendered identity. But the use of the female figure wasn't only a commentary on historic representations of femininity as seen from the present. It was also a means to interrogate women's contemporaneous understandings of themselves too. Elaine said, quote, historically culture and social pressure, cultural and social pressures dictated the way women were seen and how they saw themselves and this affected their behavior and opportunities. I realized early on that I was interested in the construction of a sense of self and gender and how, this was, um, how gender was an important part of this. I started looking back at previous generations of women and how ornaments and adornment were key elements in the construction of a female identity. Elaine's interest in the historic and gendered construction of self reaches a particular point of clarity, I think, with the motifs and themes I've talked about so far in this work, Seeing Myself Seeing from 2009. Here, two skirted figures stare into the middle distance just beyond the glossy pools of colour made from perspex at their feet. Larger in scale than previous works, though these cloaked clay figures are not perhaps quite adult life size at 135 centimetres, the figurine here is now much closer in scale to that of the human body than it was in previous works. The title suggests internal circuitous gazes. Seeing myself seeing is a cyclical proposition and one that infers both subject and object, active and passive. It's possibly a reference to the phenomenologist Maurice Merleau-Ponty and his concept of touching myself touching, which presumes that when, he, when we touch our fingers together like this, um, we're sort of coming into self-cognition in this active and passive process. Seeing and being seen by oneself, however, requires a mirror. This is something that Elaine was interested in. She was interested in Lacan, and this is where Lacan's concept of the screen would come in, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, but to, to see um, and be seen um, requires this act of a, uh, of a reflective surface to come into consciousness to, uh, to ourselves through vision. 
So perhaps then in this work, these are not two distinct figures undergoing parallel activities of looking, but in this mirrored composition, they are in fact the same woman because they are each other's reflection as self and as other. So I want to sort of propose that this might also be a way um, to kind of trace another path um, through Elaine's work, sort of going back to some of the earlier work and thinking about this duality in her symbolic use of the double figure. If we go back to this work, Ring of Roses from 1992, it appears that maybe the two figurines who are connected by the ring of steel that runs through their bodies is, is by the same mechanism, something that perpetually holds them apart so they can never actually be together. Um, and I think you can sort of see the formal um, comparisons in the composition here with um, seeing myself seeing um, so many years later. A reverse operation perhaps is happening in Uncloaked from 2002, which seems to suggest this one meter tall single figure has been split into two. I think here we can see the smaller figures emerged from the shape of the larger entity. And, and perhaps this is Elaine's most abstract piece, but I still think we can make out a kind of figurative um, reference. Elaine expressed interest in psychoanalytic approaches to philosophy, calling on the work of Joan Riviere, an associate of Sigmund Freud, who was one of the first analysts to explore the unconscious female psyche from the perspective of a woman. Elaine cited Riviere's famous 1929 text, Womanliness as Masquerade, as a point of reference in her work. And she drew particularly on Riviera's study of gender as a mask worn in a performance of femininity. And this was really important work, um, which sort of presaged the work of later scholars like Judith Butler, who talked about sort of gender performativity. Uncloaked suggests a mask or a veil being removed where something is revealed. Perhaps Elaine's comment about excavating through possibilities and permutations is also inflected with a psychoanalytic metaphor of digging into the layers of the unconscious to understand, uh, to understand our drives and desires. This work, Phantom from 2008, perhaps um, brings together well these concerns. The use of the mirror directly positioned below the figure refracts her own gaze back to her. And I sort of love the way the use of dripping glaze here and dribbles right onto the mirror um, and it really adds to this effect of the figure releasing something uncontrolled and um, perhaps from inside of herself and while she's sort of watching this process unfold so it's the, the kind of seeing and being seen. Elaine said quote I do seem to be drawn to a sense of self-awareness and internalized life and that is where I feel an almost philosophical dichotomy of public self and a private self Women have this sense most keenly, which Don John Berger describes as looking and being looked at. Women have been captives of mirrors for centuries, and it's only recently that women have been able to create images about their subjective relationships with themselves, end quote. In the 1950s, French philosopher Simone de Beauvoir articulated this idea of self as seen and uh, self as seen and seeing, not only psychically but politically, describing the mirror for women as an instrument of doubling. And what she refers to is the way that this allows a woman to see herself as something outside of herself, the way she is objectified by others. This double woman, the subject and the object is symbolic of a psychical split. So it's a kind of internalized um, understanding um, of oneself that de Beauvoir saw as this kind of existential condition for women um, in the 1950s who internalized their objectification. So the mirror becomes this quite important motif in Elaine's work as well. Um, we see it in this work we've looked at already um, in No Use Crying Over Spilled Milk, where the handheld mirror is out of reach of the figurine's gaze, but nonetheless present. This brings me to the last two series um, of Elaine's work from um, 2017 and 2018 that I want to discuss today. So this is Semaphore's I See You, which is a series of, in fact, three sculpted clay uh, female forms. Um, and I just didn't have an image. I couldn't find an image of the three of them together. So you'll have to use your imagination, but the third one looks fairly similar to the others. Um, and they're all placed on these tall steel towers and painted in military colors. 
The skirted figures um, have been glazed in muted blues and greys um, and are also um, devoid of individuality. So their facial features, um, again, sort of smoothed over. Each figure is in a slightly different standing pose with arms outstretched. Now, Elaine explains this um, as the language of flag semaphore, a 19th century maritime practice of waving flags to send encoded messages across long distances. Though the figures here don't hold flags, their arms are set at the precise angles that would have delivered this message. So I see you, um, which she talked about as kind of, um, she liked the fact that it sort of referenced like text, texting language, but also kind of using the phrase like I can see you. So this concise communique not only acknowledges our gazes upon the figurines, but they reply to that we are being watched by them. This use of the high tower upon which they sit seems to amplify this authority. And the use of small mirrors and ladders placed underneath, perhaps alluding to the journey um, and to the symbolic vantage point. Um, and it's quite interesting when you stand in front of these and you kind of move around these works, you kind of catch glimpses um, of yourself um, in the process. Some of four ICU, um, both visually and thematically, relates to a subsequent series um, called Eye to Claw to Beak. Um, and I think we can see some like amazing connections to Shapur's work this morning. Maybe we can talk about that later. Um, but this title was one that um, Elaine borrowed from uh, an essay by the American poet and essayist Anne Boyer. The series is made up of 10 clay sculptures placed individually on the same steel towers from the semaphore series. Yet instead of female bodies, here we see formidable, monolithic, quasi-modernist architectural forms. Each is different in shape and color and size, but common features seem to be doors and windows. While this, clearly, uh, while this series clearly marks a stylistic departure away from the overtly figurative, uh, body. I think that the female body is in fact still present here, um, and so is the politics of ceramics, because Elaine seems to be returning to references to the vessel here. In 2018, Elaine told me the starting point for this series was a media story about a violent attack on a woman, wherein the court judge remarked in a public statement that, quote, women should take more responsibility for their own safety, end quote. Elaine and I had many conversations about the myriad ways um, in which uh, women, much more than men, have to account for their own bodily safety in public and private spaces. And we talked about how the threat of violence against women um, and those who identify as women frequently manifest psychically in a feeling of being watched, particularly at night. And we talked a lot about how this becomes a kind of internalized um, feeling. So this, this experience of being watched um, becomes a kind of internalized lived experience um, when you're in public space. She describes um, eye to claw to beak as, quote, watchtowers sourced from different cultures around the world with strategically placed viewing slots to enable constant surveillance of a 360 degree radius, end quote. Looking at these works as objects endowed with a capacity for watching, the sculptures are anthropomorphized totems of control, not unlike our CCTV culture today. In another essay about Elaine's work, where I've written um, in more depth about these work, I've likened the symbolism of the watchtower to philosopher Michel Foucault's theor theorization of the panopticon. This term was first given by Jeremy Bentham in the late 18th century, um, referring to his design of an all-seeing tower centrally located in a prison complex so that inmates would believe they were being observed at all times, even if they weren't. Foucault saw the panopticon as widely symbolic of forms of social power, and he called this biopower, that function through vision to control people. He said, quote, there is no need for arms, physical violence, material constraints, just a gaze an inspecting gaze, a gaze which each individual under its weight will end by interiorizing to the point that he is his own overseer, each individual thus exercising this surveillance over and against himself. If Foucault's panopticon revealed the implications of space and disciplinary power on social subjects, it was 
feminist philosopher Sandra Lee Bartke in the 1990s, who understood this inspecting gaze as playing a role in the control of female bodies and femininity. And she wrote, quote, it is the women themselves who practice this discipline on and against their own bodies. The woman who checks her makeup half a dozen, time, half a dozen times a day, or who feeling fat monitors everything she eats, has become, just as surely as the inmate in the panopticon, a self-policing subject, self-committed to relentless self-surveillance. This self-surveillance is a form of obedience to patriarchy." End quote. Although Elaine's watchtowers could be seen as panopticons watching their subjects, in fact, I think these architectural structures, if we read them in relation to female bodies, are more symbolic of the internalization of this gaze um, that both Foucault and Barkey are referencing and, and this threat of violence. Like the Gun Woman series, they are active and perhaps manifestations of this culture of surveillance, reminding us that we don't always know who is watching. So just to sum up um, with this very final image, um, which I'm not going to talk about, but I think it just sums up a lot of the, visually sums up a lot of the things that I've, um, I've been, we've been looking at. Throughout her career, Elaine remained committed to critically exploring themes of femininity, power, vision, selfhood, and control. Her use of clay in this undertaking allowed her to consider the historical and political scope of ceramic production while teasing out a more nuanced material and conceptual approach to its gendered propositions both then and now. And earlier I drew comparisons between the malleability of clay and the way in which we are trying to reshape arts histories. My own research concern has always been about how to rethink our accepted histories and, cult and cultural discourses in order to make them more inclusive and expansive. So I'm just gonna end with Elaine's remarks about clay that I opened with, which are equally instructive to me about the discipline of art history. I have no real respect for it. I think it's just another material in the same way as any other material I use. It has its own qualities that you have to adhere to if you want certain outcomes, but there's no reason why you can't mix it up with lots of other materials and it still be a valid process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abby, uh, for a wonderful talk. Um, a really interesting talk and a, a really um, interesting analysis of, of Elaine's work. Uh, original analysis and tracking really interesting for me to see the development of her practice and some of those slides which I guess haven't been seen before um, and presumably you had access to some of our, some of the archives of her work or the archiving of her work um, in order to to access those yeah um, that was that was um, so helpful in fact I think it came from the archives at the school um uh, so it was really yeah I, I i you know i don't know whether those pieces still exist and i don't know whether there are photographs or records of um some of those earlier pieces but those slides are yeah really valuable so yeah, yeah. i hope maybe they'll come out one day <laughs> there's a, a question in the chat about the eye to claw to, to beak um piece um um Agatha says it's a very interesting presentation. Thank you so, so very much. Um, and commented on how unbelievably relevant uh, that particular piece, I Declare to Be, is, is today. And I'm curious also about the title of, of that piece, whether there's a reference to the hand, the eye to hand to the mouth, or why this allusion to birds. Is that something that you and her spoke, spoke about? Um, well, the title, she took that title from Anne Boyer's um, work, who um, is is kind of an incredible um, poet and writer and essayist. And I know Elaine saw an awful lot of affinities between her own ways of thinking about materials and Boyer's um, thinking about the body. So um, Boyer wrote a lot about kind of a sense of embodied time. Um, and uh, she also wrote a lot about a kind of medicalized body. Um, Boyer wrote an ex sort of really extraordinary um, long form essay about her battle with cancer which was something Elaine was also going through and I think that you know she found 
these kind of parallels between the way Boyer was talking about an understanding of time and mortality and the body and the female body, but also these kind of ideas of control over the female body as well. Um, so I know Elaine found Boyer's work really compelling and actually Elaine had reached out to Anne um, and they had sort of, um, uh, Anne Boyer had allowed Elaine to use this um, title in her work and that they had had some conversations um, about the sort of um, affinities. So I know also Anne was aware of Elaine's work, which is that's a nice connection too. Mm. Um, but I don't know specifically um, about the exact reason for why she chose um, that, that exact title. But I think, yeah, given the kind of um, idea of, of limbs and active body parts there, I think there seems like there's probably something in that. Yeah. And I was very interested also in, in your um, summation where you kind of draw parallels between your approach to art history or to critical writing and, and Elaine's approach to her materials and her work. And you know, this, this expression, having a kind of healthy disrespect for a medium is something that we, we hear quite a lot, but Elaine and you both talk about having no respect uh, for, for the history of ceramics or perhaps the history of, of, of writing. And there's clearly something much more radical in that, something perhaps more rebellious. I was wondering if, if my observations, you know, strike a chord with you. Do, do, do you feel that there's something really quite radical in your approach as well as hers? Actually, I mean, I suppose it was, I, I haven't had time to process my thoughts on this enough, but it was so interesting hearing Roger and Darren talk about um, mastering something and being, being an expert in something and skill and training and, and kind of, you know, intuitive knowledge and how that kind of builds up. But I think the idea of you know through kind of knowledge comes power but also through like destruction comes creation <laughs> and learning how to break the rules mm -hmm. is such an important part of becoming not that I in any way would call myself a master but I think in kind of understanding I think like Darren talked about how to like really push the limits of clay and I think it's good to think about how we push the limits of our own disciplines whatever those might be that we we work in or work outside of or adjacent to or, or however you want to describe it um, and I've I suppose I I think I found Elaine's sort of proposition about having no real respect for I think it's not just the medium, she's talking about the long history of the tradition of being medium bound and, you know, the way ceramics and its principles and kind of this purity of only using clay and, and this idea about, you know, how, how do you kind of challenge those conformities to those material principles mm -hmm. um, but she's looking at it in this such interesting kind of gendered lens and she's really thinking about how do we think about, you know, the domesticity of you know, pottery um, as also something that is linked to the female body and figurines as, as part of this tradition that also has this quite sinister tradition, like objectifying the female body for like decoration in the home. Um, so I, I think, I mean, I would never say have no respect for art history, I'd probably never work again. <laughs> Um, but I think it's, I think it's exciting and important to, to think about being disciplinarily trained and then how you start to kind of um, unpick um, some of those things that you've always been told you really must do mm -hmm. in order to kind of challenge the parameters that um, maybe have been restrictive to others in the past right and and mm -hmm. thinking about um, women being political in in ceramics I think does that. Exactly and you know I think you talked about um you know finding ways to break the rules but of course you know for Elaine and many other women and underrepresented you know creative people it's not so much a question of choice of choosing to break the rules but it's an absolute must you know the the, the, the gun is a necessary weapon um, in in certain contexts where you know fair representation is an impossibility or it, and it has been um, Is that yeah. okay? <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think that's true. And I think, you know, the use of the gun um, in, in that series, in the Gun Woman series, and the use of violence is very interesting mm -hmm. um, because it, it is kind of making the point that we're not just talking about, um, I suppose, this kind of internalized sense of being watched. We're actually talking about like a genuine experience of 
like violence out in the world that is consistent and this kind of you know very real representation of a gun um and the female figure kind of operating it and using it um you know I think is is a point where Elaine I, I think there's such an interesting turning point where suddenly the figurine just becomes active and yeah. she did talk quite a lot about always having her figure's eyes closed because she wanted it she wanted her figure to be appear to be reflecting internally so it was about a kind of internal reflection but she said that it was a big change for her when she decided to have those figures with eyes open and wielding guns and I think it's important that that you know you see the way that kind of um passive into active happens in that in that kind of particular work yeah yeah with eyes open mm -hmm. thank you so much Abby I'm sorry to have to stop there we have to break for lunch. Um, but thank you so much for your presentation and fascinating talk and insight into Elaine's work. So I'd like to thank um, Abby once again and all of the panelists this morning. So to Roger Kneebone, to Darren Ellis, to um, Chapeau Puyan, and also to Javier Quadras for wonderful presentations and a fascinating start to the day.